Hi, I'm Michael Rodoni of Los Angeles Times here in our San Diego Comic-Con photo and video studio. Now we have the cast and creators of Nosferatu, a new, well, I guess the show's finished, um, uh, finished its first season of horror series on AMC. <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about that. Uh, thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Three more episodes. Three more episodes. Oh, because yeah. I've, I've finished. So yeah. Two more nights. Two more nights. Woohoo! Yeah. Um, so, this comes from a very popular novel. Um, have there been any uh, uh, responses or comments from fans of the book that have uh, affected you so far with your, with your show? I mean,. I think most of the fans have been really stoked. Most of the people who love the book seem to have responded to the TV show in a really positive way, um, which is, I mean, I think what you hope for. Mm -hmm. Well, I, sh I should mention to the uninitiated, this is Joe Hill, the author of the <laughs> novel and executive producer. <laughs> just, uh, just in case you didn't uh, know. Just FYI. Um, I mean, one of the great pleasures of the TV show is an, a chance to both, you know, um, get the novel on screen, mm -hmm. but also expand the world and, right. and dig deeper into the lives of the characters. And um, you've, got, you've got Vic McQueen, a young woman who has a supernatural gift and a power to bend reality. And you've got her adversary, Charlie Manx, who's got a car that runs on human souls instead mm -hmm. of gasoline. And, um, but, but, and those are the, that's the focus of the novel. But in the TV show, we also get to these glimpses of other people who have occult powers and a much broader, scarier world. And, you know, I love that. So your carbon footprint is zero. I guess we should give you some credit for that. <laughs> that's right. I should get some, uh, should get some cultural props for that. Yeah. Props for that. Thanks, guys. So actually, you're the hero and you're the villain. <laughs> yeah, riding around on her gas guzzling dirt bike, like, sh you know, like there's I, not I, any kind of you should be ashamed of yourself, fossil really. fuel emergency in this country. What about all of these young children that you take that could have got, what if Greta Thunberg was one of them? Yeah, well, you know, children. You exactly. never. <laughs> in the book, would you rather they be in cages somewhere? You're for children in cages. <laughs> I, I feel like you, not. you positioned us to like really be <laughs> at odds here. Yeah. You know uh, I mean? There's a gulf between us. <laughs> About bringing it to the screen. Um, yeah. This is, uh, I regard this as a, a true new golden age of television, especially because of the explosion of long form storytelling. I'm with you. So I'd imagine that you're very happy and you as well, very happy to be able to expand it, to, to give the novel a full treatment instead of kind of cramming it into a two hour movie. Yeah. Totally. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we are in this we are in this era. I think it started with Breaking Bad where TV shows for the first time sort of realized their full novelistic potential. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was harder in the days when there were only three networks and a TV show had you had to grind out a TV show that went. 22 or 24 or 30 episodes or something mm -hmm. and and none of the characters could ever change but really since breaking bad all the rules have been different and uh you know changes changes exciting it's great to you know um throw a big you know wrench into things four episodes in and um the freedom is exciting yeah and you know just to speak to the novel for a moment the characters in the novel I think are so rich and nuanced and if you only had two hours in which to tell the tale of a 700 page novel um, you might get a lot of the action set pieces in um, you might get a lot of the scares in but I don't know that you would get such beautiful performances um, with the kind of depth that we have from our cast because we have <laughs> the time um, to linger on them. See, we really do like each other. We do. We, love <laughs> we do. We do actually. <laughs> and the the novel. I mean, the the first series of the first season of the show is only the first third of the novel. Yeah. So there's so much more story to tell before we even arrive at the end of the book, which is really exciting. I think for obviously for Jamie and for Joe, but also for us as actors to really be able to explore these characters over time and in different scenarios and time passes between the first season and if we're fortunate enough to do any more of the show which I think we all hope we are um, you know there would be I think uh, a, a real new perspective for audiences so mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, there's a lot of elements unique to this story that I think the mm -hmm. adaptation um, celebrates and I think the adaptation also benefits from yeah I'd imagine as actors it's a, a real boon to be able to develop your character slowly instead of the old way of kind of 
making sure we, we know who you are right away. The, yeah. It, yeah. In this era, there's a lot of time to reveal slowly. Absolutely, and I think one of the things that I was so attracted to about uh, well, the source material and then Jamie's adaptation was the the complexity of the characters. I think there's a line which I always miss. I don't phrase it correctly. What is it? Um, people aren't just one thing. They're not good or just or bad. Do you remember it? D are you talking about Linda's, Linda's line? line? Um, they can be both. There's a beautiful moment in uh, episode four where Vic is confronting Linda about um, her father's abuse in the house mm -hmm. and um, and sh Vic admits that she thinks she always kind of knew that it was happening but sh I think your line is but I tucked it away like a secret because I needed to believe dad was good and then Linda's line is he is good and he's not people can be both and I think that that's true of all the characters right. really in the book yeah. um, the line that I like to say that I, I can't remember if it's in the book or if I read it in a recap, it was something that Joe said somewhere, um, which was the brightest light casts the darkest shadow. And um, I think I ripped that, that off from someone smarter. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, well, I'm going to continue to attribute it to you. Okay. okay. <laughs> I accept that. But, but in answer to your question, I think it um, that complexity and the three-dimensionality of both the characters and the themes that exist within this horror lens uh, do lend itself to a television series that can be explored on really intricate levels because, um, like Jamie was saying, it's not just the scares. There's, like, there's really huge issues in here about morality, about parenting, about... Uh, childhood wounding psychology and um, I've spoken to so many people and every time I ask them like what the show is about something else comes up like it's it's everyone sees it through a different lens and I think that's just such a testament to what you guys have done is it's like this prism in which you can kind of look at it from so many different angles and if it was a film I don't know if you'd be able to mm. you know gleam all of those different I mean I also think that colors. good horror is about compassion not about yes. sadism you know, and that, that, that when, when a horror story really succeeds, it's because you fell in love with the characters and mm. you were completely committed to them. And then you really felt it when they were put through the worst, you know, mm. when they, they were fed to the thresher. Mm. And, um, and I think with a TV show, you have an opportunity to know a person, to discover a person and, and fall for them in a way that's a little harder when there's only 90 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, and you got to get to the action, got to hit that action beat. Well, I, I don't know if you guys have seen Haunting of Hill House, but... Oh, I love the Haunting of Hill House <laughs> so much. You know, like it just raised too, the yeah. bar for the whole genre. Yeah, yeah it gets to what you're talking about, how it's a horror horror series, but really it's about a family. If you ask people what that thing is about and they're paying attention, it's about a family yeah. and the dynamics within that and all of the messed up things that happen in a family. Uh, so about your characters, um, what the same question for both of you really what was the key guidance you got to realize these characters i mean you have material from the page mm -hmm. and you have your scripts but what were the things that that you were told or that you you learned in your research that really infused your character um for me all the answers were in the book i mean you know jamie and and uh, and her writers room did an amazing job of bringing that story to life and dramatizing it, and I think creating these characters in in um, in real three dimension. But but uh, I just kept going back to the book whenever I had questions. I felt like there was so much. Um, you know, Joe has the capacity to uh, illuminate an aspect of a character or a situation you know, in, in just a sentence or a paragraph in a way that like just kind of reading that book a couple of times as we were getting ready to shoot was something that really drew me in and made me understand where this character's coming from. I think any good antagonist or villain has to start uh, from a place of compassion, you know, for me as an actor. Like I have to be able to understand where he's coming from, why he is the way he is. Um, and with Manx, you know, oftentimes when you trace back that kind of evil to its origins, it leads you to a point of childhood trauma in one way or another. And that's certainly the case for Manx. And so for me to really get into that and understand it and, um, and not judge it, but embody it mm -hmm. from, from that warped, twisted, um, fractured perspective was... Um, was the point of entry that I chose because I think uh, I think 
that as an actor, I need to understand how Manx believes that he's doing the right thing. And that's the thing that sets him apart. And I think makes him a little bit more complex than your average kind of mm. anti-hero. Well, he, if you judge it, then it, it's a one-dimensional mm. mustache twirling performance. But did you have models for him? Not really. I think there was a lot of physicality and a lot of vocal transformation that I was able to explore on my own. And mm -hmm. I didn't really need, again, like there was so much richness in the book. I didn't really, I'm not, I don't, I don't usually look at other interpretations of things in order to help me come up with a character for myself. I feel like it comes from within unless it's like a, a character who's based in mm. reality, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm playing a character like another deplorable homicidal psychopathic serial killer I played, uh, uh, Threadson on American Horror Story, mm -hmm. that to me was more rooted in um, grounded kind of like I did a lot of research into like actual serial killers to play that role mm -hmm. but this is a heightened supernatural world where the psychology of the characters really tied into trauma that befell him as a child and so that combined with the world that Joe created in his novel and like the physical transformation that I was able to undergo to play all the different iterations of the character it was much more of an internal kind of process for me. I didn't really look outward to other projects or other films or other characters to kind of help me define who he was. And that transformation, may I add, is quite astonishing. I remember one of our first scenes together, which was you were transforming into your older version yeah. and the vocalizations and everything, one would think that maybe they kind of put it in and post from, like, I don't know, It's to me it sounded like a car wheezing but it was Zach he did all that like the the vocal transformations and and you worked really hard with the physicality and everything and it was quite astonishing I would have thought watching it that it would have been CGI mm. the actual movements and the sounds or whatever but it it was all right there and it was incredible how you kind of interlaced it with the car mm. I just thought it was yeah, yeah that master class in acting for me <laughs> makes a lot of sense <laughs> yeah. uh, let me split that question Anytime. in two for pay, you pay me later uh, I'll, I'll split the question too for you. Sure. Uh, the the question of the guidance that that you got, what what yes. really helped you, but also what did you take from the book, if you can distill it, the the key elements of her mm. that you had to convey. Okay, so part A. Um, <laughs> I think well the guidance I got from Jamie and then also Kari, who was uh, set up director, um, was to kind of trust myself. I think I I read the script and the book and initially I was kind of, it wasn't typically a character that I, I'd look at and go, oh, that's me. I just kind of come to it and, and bring myself. I uh, were on the surface fairly different. Um, I definitely had a tom, you know, a bit of a tomboy in many ways, but um, I don't know, she, I, I a very kind of I've been really fortunate to exist in a world and in a family in an environment that encouraged my creative expression and so on and so um yeah I think that took a lot of pressure off because I I was a little worried I was like I'm not actually I'm not tough like Vic I um I cry at the death of little beetles on the road and like <laughs> you know um she has this kind of fortitude that maybe I don't have and um I just didn't think I was a hero you know and um and they were like just just bring you so I was able to bring a bit of my own like quirks and weird stuff and just my heart and um so that was really liberating and it, and when I look back on the book as well like it, it it really is there like she's full of this kind of creative expression and it's bursting to get out of her so there are many parallels that we have um even if I d kind of didn't realize it at the first sort of audition or two um and then what part b part from the book itself oh my gosh there's so many aspects I could speak to on that um I think uh, there, there is one line in the book that that is something about like ice runs through her blood. Do you mm. know that? What do you? 
Do you mm. mind? Do you remember that one? It's one in one of those 700 and something pages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah you remember every word. You remember. Yeah. That, right? um, <coughs> and she's got some. She's got some hard bark on her, though. Yeah. She mm. sure does. But I think that was really interesting to me because that that moment signified a place that we wanted to arrive at in mm. the series but not start with because that was 18 year old Vic in the book but we kind of changed it up so I would s I'd pl I'd play the emotional arc of Vic but from the age of 18 instead of from the age of eight mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of an end point we wanted to get to within this series um, within this season I should say um, but it was something that really resonated with me because I know that feeling, that moment where things can turn when all of the emotion becomes so huge and immense and all of the kind of the wilderness within you distills down to this moment of kind of sharpness and coolness. And mm. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of just a very specific moment that stuck out with me. I, I just, I don't know where, what else to talk about because it's, it's so huge. The book has such a richness and, and a wealth of themes, but that was one that I kind of, clung to in this Well, it makes season. sense that, it, I mean, it's much more useful for an actor to, to have a, a moment, uh, something yeah. specific than a wash. But I definitely would use the subtext and the thoughts that Joe had written in the book that, and I would transplant it into the scenes that existed in the show. So I would be thinking the same, the exact thoughts that Joe had written down occasionally in the show. All right, let me hit you with a kind of frivolous question about your, your series. You have a... Uh, uh, in your book and in, in the series, there are, there are a few um, mentions of uh, another writer's universe. Mm. Um, David Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, because and it uh, frequently references uh, uh, Cloud Atlas and the Thousand Bottoms of mm -hmm. Jacob de Zoot. I see where you're going. Yes. Uh, and uh, s there are references to like Pennywise's circus and whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, that other guy. Yeah, that other know. writer. Yeah. <laughs> so are there uh, kind of, are there crossovers or references you guys would like to see? get worked into the show? Well, the thing about the, the, thing about the book is it's about a, a vampire that feasts on souls. And when I was working on it, I got talking to my dad about the book he was working on. He was working on a novel called Dr. Sleep, mm -hmm. which turns out to be a family of vampires that feed on souls. And so we suddenly realized we were writing stories that had very similar antagonists. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I wound up sticking the true knot um, the soul vampires in his book in Nosferatu mm -hmm. and Charlie Manx turns up as uh, a sort of boogeyman figure in Dr. Sleep. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> this is a first uh, Someone warns, someone warns a little kid in uh, Dr. Sleep that if you're not good, Charlie Manx will come and take you away. Oh. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. yeah. But now you got to read Dr. Sleep. I so do. you guys don't have any uh, suggestions for crossovers you'd like to see? I feel like, you know, I uh, let yeah. Joe do his thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> let, Joe and Jamie, let Joe and Jamie hash it out. Uh, I, I like that fans are intrigued by that stuff, but I don't know. I feel, I feel like our job is really to kind of connect to these characters and um, anchor them in some modicum of truth and believable circumstance and what happens around them or, you know, what worlds are represented like in that fandom realm is something that like I'm excited when fans get excited, mm -hmm. but like my contribution to that excitement is just my connection to the character mm -hmm. and my relationship to like mm -hmm. the given circumstances around that character. Um, so I tend to not kind of plug into those things that I don't really have too much control over. Well, then I, I want to force you to plug into one right now, all of you. Last thing is uh, you're at Com Comic-Con, which is, has to be old hat for you by now, but um, if you were forced to cosplay someone, anyone, who would it be? You can't say Spock. Maybe we could go as the like as Super Mario Brothers, and that way we could right. like wear a full <laughs> thing and be like, you know, like in full costume. Great. Let's right? talk to our stylist okay. next. Great. Next year, Comic Copy. Con. Copy Very that. Much hope to set in that. <laughs> yeah. So, do you guys have? Uh, I mean, for me, it would be Vic McQueen for oh. sure. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to go as Charlie. Then. Thank you, oh, Joe. There you go. <laughs> thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for for thank coming you. in, and cool. folks are. Few more episodes of Nosferatu. Yeah, great. Thanks, Thanks for having us. So Take much. care.